Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and um, I got a lot of good feedback on the um, video clip that I did last week where we I went through some examples of informed decision making and so I chose another one I'm going to call it informed email of the week to give you some strategies how this all works so here's the email I'm paraphrasing a little bit here just to make it concise I'm eating more of a plant-based diet but at the same time noticing that my thyroid and glucose levels continue to go up some people tell me that I need to eat more fat because fat promotes better thyroid function they recommend that I eat wild fish and bone broth I think perhaps more vegetables what do you think okay well this would be the informed response first of all eating a plant-based diet is a step in the right direction but most people don't do it very well without some instruction they're confused as you are about things like how much fat they should eat they often eat a lot of processed vegan foods or they continue to eat dairy products thus their health can get worse while eating a quote-unquote better diet so in response to that you know I might just say don't eat so much fat so people say okay well I'm just gonna eat more vegetables well here's the the problem vegetables only contain hundred calories per pound and so the, the amount of vegetables you have to eat to replace the fat that you're gonna get rid of in your diet would mean that you probably have to quit your job and stay home and eat vegetables and as fun as that sounds you may not be able to do it so even though vegetables are great and you want to eat as many of them as you can you're gonna have to support those those calories and get them from another source which is where the starchy foods like legumes and corn and grains and uh, potatoes and squashes that's where those foods come into play so if people don't do that what happens and I'm sure you know people this has happened to they'll say something like I switched to a diet a plant-based diet or even a vegan diet I was eating just tons of fruits and vegetables and then I started feeling weak and hungry and I just had to go back to eating animal food well they didn't have to go back to eating animal food they just needed to know how to do this diet and do it right so first of all please join wellness forum health let us teach you how to do this right so you can succeed at it instead of trial and error and ending up right back where you started from but there are two other things i want to mention in response to this email i've written a re reference article on the bone broth um, thing which is posted in the health brace library when you read it you'll clearly see that there is no evidence to support the idea that bone broth helps with any measurement of health including thyroid function or anything else and as for those of you who are telling you that you should eat more fat because it will help with thyroid function one of the things that we train into people here is when people make these claims say listen I'd be happy to read any journal articles that you can show me that eating more fat will help my thyroid condition or my soon emerging thyroid condition um, and then you can look at those to see if the study design is right if there are conflicts of interest if there's actually statistical significance or clinical significance which are two different things and if I've lost you already then you need to learn how to read research and to look at this information so you can make good decisions which is another thing that we do here very well so um, and by the way I just started the research and writing course last week I loved it we were on the phone till 11 30 instead of 11 o'clock because of all the great questions and stuff we talked about we recorded this call so that if you decide you want to join later you can and uh, listen to the recorded first call do the assignments and then join us for the second one so anyway some ideas about how to approach these things and there are so many different things to look at here it would be impossible to go through this and look at studies in the whole nine yards but I think you get the idea before you start jumping off the cliff eating more fat eating more vegetables you know flitting from here to there trying different things to make things go away or get better learn what is right and do that and save yourself all that frustration that's why I started this company my whole beginning and changing my diet and improving my health was trial and error mostly error in the beginning so I thought well maybe other people would not like to have that experience um, the second thing I want to mention is our first weight loss class was last week and you can join any time by the way um, there is no set time that the classes start and um, I listened in because um, I always like to listen to a new program we have a phenomenal instructor her name is Mary Marshall she's a registered nurse and she's really skilled and experienced at doing this kind of thing and I had a member tell me yesterday um, that um, she felt like she got her money's worth from just that one call she said that was so incredible um, so anyway if you are struggling with weight loss and by the way not one word was spoken during the two hours about low fat and choosing foods and reviewing the food pyramid and more food plans I mean you guys are smart 
you can understand an eating plan. We don't need to review it with you 39 times. We have to deal with all of the rest of it, all right? So that's what these, uh, these um, teleconference workshops are all about. They happen twice a month. You can join us anytime. And then last but not least, I'm so pleased to be hearing from some of you that you're interested in careers. Keep those inquiries coming. Happen to, happy to talk to you, share with you our experience here, where we think the opportunities in the marketplace are, what kind of education you need, how we can help, or in many instances I tell people where they should go someplace else to get an education based on what they want to do. It's not just all about here. Um, I want to see people succeed at this because it's really good for all of us. In other words, my, you know, you've heard this saying before, a rising tide lifts all boats. The better everybody else does, the better we do here. So in many instances, I'll tell people, you should go to medical school. We don't have a medical school here, right? That doesn't benefit me at all, except that people getting good at what they do, following their passion, that's great for all of us. All right, so I often talk about screening programs, and um, there's a, I, I'm going to, just for those of you who are curious, there's a new blood test that's being um, uh, touted as being an early detection test for cancer. I have a lot of concerns about it, but I don't put information out until I have a chance to really research it. I'm working on that, so hold tight. I will be back to you on that, but today I want to talk about ovarian cancer screening, which is increasingly being recommended. One of the reasons being that by the time ovarian cancer is detected, it's almost always fatal. So according to new guidelines from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, asymptomatic women should not be screened for ovarian cancer. The task force gives screening for ovarian cancer a D grade. Now if you go to their website to see what D grade means, um, it says that D means recommends against and is accompanied by these statements. There is moderate or high certainty that the service has no net benefit or that the harms outweigh the benefits and discourage the use of the service. That's pretty strong language. This is a final statement which confirms draft statements that were issued in July of last year that essentially said the same thing. They open it up for comments and then make a final um, recommendation. Previous guidelines in 2004 and 2012 also recommended against screening. So the body of evidence is getting stronger against screening for ovarian cancer instead of weaker. The task force concluded that current screening methods do not reduce the risk of dying from ovarian cancer. However, false positives often lead to unnecessary surgery in women who don't have cancer. The analysis that led to the final recommendations included four trials with a total of 293,038 subjects. That's quite a big cohort. Several screening methods were used, including transvaginal ultrasound, both with and without CA125 testing. No trial showed that screening reduced the risk of ovarian cancer mortality. But in two trials, between 1 and 3% of women who had test results indicating ovarian cancer, the women actually did not have it. Major complications occurred in up to 15% of those women as a, as a result of undergoing procedures, which turned out to be unnecessary. And by the way, that is one of the biggest issues with um, screening programs that don't work, is it's not just that they don't catch cancer at an early enough stage to prevent dying from it, but they often sweep, uh, in this case women, into more follow-up testing and treatment that turns out to cause a lot of harm. The researchers also looked at, and I thought this was very interesting, the psychological consequences of screening and in one trial found that repeated follow-up scans increase the risk of psychological distress. Um, this is not surprising. In fact, I have covered studies in the past that clearly show that if you, for example, look at people two years after um, a cancer scare, like we found something suspicious come in, we need to do a biopsy or another image or whatever, um, the psychological distress that results from that is identical to the psychological stress experienced by people who actually did have cancer and had treatment for it. That's significant. We can't really ignore that. The recommendations do not apply to women be, uh, who are identified as being at high risk for ovarian cancer, such as those who have the BRCA gene mutations. But the benefits of both screening and oophorectomy or ovary removal in this population may have been overstated. Studies show that some carriers of the BRCA mutation who underwent prophylactic oophorectomy developed peritoneal cancer after the procedure. And another thing, people who are at risk, who are carriers of this gene mutation, are also at higher risk for many other types of cancer, including prostate, yes, men carry the mutation too, pancreatic, gallbladder, and bile duct and stomach cancers, and malignant melanoma. 
According to some studies, women with the gene mutation do not benefit from screening programs, genetic testing, and prophylactic mastectomy in order to avoid breast cancer mortality. However, uh, prophylactic ovarectomy does reduce the risk of dying of ovarian cancer. But these strategies have nothing to offer to address the, um, the high risk of other types of cancer, which I mentioned earlier. So, in my opinion, this means that the best advice we can give to people who want to reduce the risk of developing or dying from cancer, including the carriers of the gene mutation, is to focus on optimal diet and lifestyle habits. Now, I've been covering for years studies that show that the right diet, the right lifestyle habits, focusing on weight, good idea for people who want to reduce their risk of, um, of getting cancer or dying from it in the general population. But um, I decided to take a look and see if there were any studies that showed that people, women carrying the gene mutations would benefit from diet and lifestyle change. Actually, I was able to find some. One study showed that maintaining a healthier BMI and eating more fruits and vegetables was helpful in preventing BRCA-related breast cancer. Another study showed that eating a healthy diet is defined by the Canadian Healthy Eating Index as associated with reduced risk of breast cancer for mutation carriers. Yet another study showed that women with the mutations who engaged in physical activity daily had half the risk of developing breast cancer as their sedentary counterparts. A research group is currently conducting a pilot study which will randomize BRCA1 and 2 carriers to a multifaceted lifestyle intervention or control group to determine if things like fitness and diet and psychological factors reduce the risk of cancer in women at high risk. While more research is needed for this population of high-risk women, there is such a large body of evidence which has consistently shown that people at high risk and people at low risk of disease, all diseases, not just cancer, benefit from adopting optimal diet and lifestyle habits. So I think it's fair to assume that for at-risk women, such as the gene carriers, better habits would not only reduce their risk of breast and ovarian cancer, also the risk of cancers for which they are genetically predisposed. I mean, how many body parts can you take out, right? You have to look at a different strategy in order to address all of those. So adopting optimal habits is the best protective strategy. And what I don't like to see is people falling into the false sense of security. Um, I'm having images done, I'm having screening programs, I've had organs removed, I, you know, people do all kinds of things in order to avoid cancer, um, sometimes not realizing that the real thing that can help you avoid cancer, stay lean, exercise, um, eat an optimal diet, and focus on overall optimal health, that's your best protection. All right, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.